To say that JNC 80 elicited a little bit of con uh, controversy is a little like saying that the Grand Canyon is a little steep. Both are wild underestimates of what is actually happening. In the case of JNC 8, there were a number of things that were uh, kind of controversial at the time, and we're talking with uh, one of my favorite people in the whole field of hypertension, Dr. Franz Meserly, who is a professor of medicine icon uh, at Mount Sinai Medical School, and we're talking about INVEST. Before we hit INVEST, let's, let's talk a little bit about JNC8, because we're talking in, in terms of targets. What happened in JNC8 that you would like to see uh, changed, and maybe will with INVEST? Very good point, Rick. I'm glad to be here. Um, what did bother me in JNC8 are really the new blood pressure goal for patients above age 60. As you may know, JNC7 basically said patients should have a blood pressure below 140 over 90. And that was a fairly reasonable statement, although the evidence perhaps did not, there was not good evidence to support this statement. But now, all of a sudden, in JNC8, we are talking about a target of 150 over 90. And that is of concern to me. Uh, we have to consider that in patients below age 60, we even have less evidence. But there, we, we take it for granted that 140 over 90 is good. Now, why should it be in those among us who are a little older than 60, why should it be? all of a sudden 150 over 90. Well, maybe there's some data now to support that. So what, tell us about INVEST. Well, remember INVEST, at that time, the biggest study, uh, it came out before all had uh, 22,000 patients, all of them had coronary artery disease, all of them had hypertension, and they were randomized to either a verapamil-based strategy or an atenolol-based strategy. And the primary end, there was no difference in the primary endpoint. So, what Dr. Bangalore and collaborators, including myself, did is we took the INVEST study, we looked at those patients who were older than 60 years of age, and patients who had a blood pressure at baseline higher than 150 systole. Okay? And these were about, if I remember well, 8,300 some patients. And we then subdivided them into those who had a blood pressure on treatment below 140, those who had a blood pressure between 140 and 150 systolic, and those who had a blood pressure above 150. So three distinct groups about equal in size, and the baseline criteria between the three groups were not much different. A little bit, but not much. Now, I want to make it very clear, this is not the randomized trial, right? Correct. This is a retrospective analysis in a trial. So it's basically data dredging, basically to be taken with a good grain of salt. But it's data we didn't have before. It's data we didn't have before, that's absolutely right. And we don't have much other data, so at least we have to go by what we have here, right? right? So well, what did you find? What we found is actually with regard to the primary endpoint, there was not much of a difference between those who were between 140, 150, and those who were below um, 140. Um, the same holds true for coronary artery disease. However, when we then go to stroke, there was clear-cut difference in that those whose systolic blood pressure was below 140 had a significant lesser stroke rate than those who were above 140. And this was true for fatal and non-fatal stroke. Now you're gonna say, well, you know, at what cost did you achieve that, right? I mean, what were the adverse events? And everyone would say, yeah, when you lower blood pressure too much, you will have more adverse events. The exact the opposite was true. We had much less adverse, adverse events in patients who were below 140 than in those 140, 150, not to speak of the ones who were above 150. So our conclusion was very simply straightforward that, uh, you know, at least in the invest data, in patients with coronary artery disease, in patients who had hypertension above age 60, a blood pressure of 140 or below is the way to go. 
I have to state, though, and I want to make that very clear, Alan Gradman wrote the accompanying editorial. And Alan is a very smart guy. And he made the point, and I think it's a very valid point, these were not patients randomized to these groups, right? These were patients who achieved this blood pressure. And so these were better responders versus not so good responders. And I think that's a valid point. That's a valid point to be considered. So our data are to be taken with a good grain of salt. What would you suggest? What do you do in clinical practice? I mean, what, what do you tell your, your guys? Look, I, I think, and here we come to one other, uh, uh, I think, what should I say? Uh, should I say drawback in the JNC-8? The JNC-8 only talks about numbers. We are not treating numbers, we are treating patients. And if I have a patient who is completely quote unquote healthy, has no other problem than high blood pressure, in many of my patients the blood pressure is 125 over 70, even if they are 80 years old and they do remarkably well. They have absolutely no problem, no side effects, they function well and so on. However, if it's a very fragile patient who has Parkinson's disease and you know has tendency to fall or syncopies, I'll be happy to leave the blood pressure at 150 plus, even if he's only 62 or 63, knowing that the risk of stroke will be higher in that patient, but on the other hand, the risk of fall will be lower, and the fall can be a deadly event in such a fragile patient. So, individualized by all standards. Now, this is from the uh, August 26th issue of Jack. So, as we speak here, it's a couple of weeks behind us. Have you gotten any comments from, uh, from colleagues in terms of you're nuts or thank you? Well, actually, we got one comment on the heart.org, and I, I, I found it a little bit funny. Uh, they said this, it, it, this is voodoo medicine. Why would it be, the arteries are all the same, why would it be that the J curve or the, the, um, the nadir of the J curve is different for the heart and for the brain? Well, these are facts. I mean, you know, have to consider that in a given patient, and that should not be a surprise, to optimally reduce the stroke risk, you may have to lower the blood pressure to a level that the heart is no longer, can no longer take, right? Because coronary flow is doing diastole. So it may well be that the low blood pressure can induce ischemia for the heart, but is still not there where it should be for stroke. The concept here is target organ heterogeneity. Not all organs function optimally at exactly the same blood pressure. I think that's a very important concept. Well, for the entire paper, please take a look at Jack, August 26th, uh, 2014, for Dr. Resolute's paper and also the uh, editorial comment. For Cardiosource World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.